This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Hello, hello. Hey, hey, what's going on? What's uh, up? I feel like we should just dive in. So today we are joined by DHH, and I just want to say hello and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. It is an exciting time to chat Ruby. It's which is really any week, right? But um, <laughs> <laughs> even more so lately. Yeah, absolutely. So just diving right in. Hotwire. It's what everyone in the Rails world, or most everyone is talking about right now. Yeah, just kind of want to know what the response has been to that and how that's felt for you guys at Basecamp. The response has been phenomenal. What's interesting about Hotwire is that while the comprehensiveness of it is new, the core philosophy is as old as the beginning of Rails, basically. You can trace this all the way back to RJS, to Prototype, to SJR after that. This is an approach to web development we've essentially followed since 2005 when Ajax first appeared on the scene. This idea that HTML is at the center of everything. What's interesting about that, I think, is that sometimes old ideas need a little bit of time in the cold before people are ready for them again. And I think we needed to go through this, in my opinion, desert of buy all the things for the past 10 years to appreciate what we actually had and figure out whether there was a way to get some of the old simplicity with some of the new capability. And I think that that's what Hotwire is bringing. And it's also one of the things that's just interesting. It's, in some ways, it's a little bit similar to what we went through with Hey, our new email product at Basecamp that all this sprung out of, that all this was extracted from, where we've often talked about, you know what, if we had launched Hey in 2010, no one would have given the damn. Because everyone would have been like, what are you talking about? Gmail is the best thing ever. Google is just a benevolent, wonderful big tech company that gives email products away for free. Why would you possibly want to even offer or think about an alternative to that? There was just not a, a space for that to exist. If we had done Hotwire in 2015, people would have gone like, what are you talking about? React is the greatest thing ever. And yeah, okay, this Redux thing's a little bit complicated, but just stick with it and muscle through it, and it's going to be great. And it's going to be great. And now you are five years later, and a lot of people realize, oh, actually, maybe it was not great for me, for this thing I was working for, for our team, for whatever. Hotwire is catching a moment. And it's catching a moment which is just fascinating in its timing. It's catching the moment perfectly, like React server-side rendering literally got announced I think the day or two days before we went live with Hotwire, there's something in the air. There's something in the air, A, about rediscovering the beauty of server-side rendering and all the magical things that that allows us to do. In fact, I don't even need to promote it. I've been promoting that for 20 years. So let's listen to the React server-side components people. That whole intro video was essentially a poem to server-side rendering. And hey, look. The database is right there. You can just do a query and you have, don't have to go over the network. And like, it has all these magic benefits, right? And there's been a lot of other moves in that direction. So this approach, this feedback we're getting to Hotway now is because of the timing. You can keep saying the same thing for 20 years. Until people are ready to listen, it doesn't matter. Another example of this, we published a book in 2013 called Remote Office Not Required that I thought at the time was totally late, dating the obvious. And of course, the whole world is going to go remote like any moment now. And you know what? It wasn't cricket, but it also wasn't like this slam hit thing. Let's get the whole thing. It was just sort of a slow growth. And then boom, pandemic happens. Everyone goes remote. And all of a sudden, oh, hey, this remote thing. Maybe this, this could actually work. I don't know. Maybe we could just allow people to work from home if that's what they want to do even after this is over. So sometimes you have to just keep saying the same damn thing over and over and over again, and then just wait. Wait for the pendulum to come your way, because sometimes you can nudge a pendulum in one direction or another, but very few people, I'd actually say no person, can individually move that pendulum. 
You can stand ready to be there when it comes swinging your way, but that's about it. So I feel like that's what we've been doing with Hotwire. And it's just so interesting to me to contrast it to the reception the Turbo Links originally got, which was, that wasn't even just cricket. That was hostile. Turbo Links for a long time had a directly hostile reception. People were like, what the fuck is this? This is breaking all my stuff. My J4 plugins don't work. What's going on? This is dumb. This is stupid. Just write it all in whatever spot. And now we're second. <laughs> the new version of Turbo is like a third of it is still Turbo Link. Renamed to Turbo Drive because it does a few more things. And then we added other things to it. But this is essentially a continuation of all these ideas, all the things that are already presented with, let's not disregard, a new name, a new look, a new presentation. I think that's a good part of it. We were actually debating this internally. Turbo for the longest time was called Turbo Link 6. We were creating it all in the Turbo Link repository and just adding more and more and more to it. And we were like, it already has a name. Turbo is actually a little more difficult to get as a repo name elsewhere because it's not as unique as Turbo Links. So we almost got to the point of like, oh, let's just launch it as Turbo Links. But I'm so happy we didn't. You got to grab that moment. You got to grab it with something fresh. And I think that's what we did. And to see that this is picking up, not just in the Ruby community, but in the web community at large, is even more exciting. There are people working on Hotwire integration in Django, in Go, in Laravel, in Symfony, in Go, in all sorts of languages, right? Because this isn't a Ruby issue. This whole idea that, you know what, maybe we shouldn't spot all the things is not a Ruby issue. It is something web developers across the spectrum are interested in. And of course, it's also interesting, perhaps, is the one area where we haven't seen a lot of interest, of course, is the JavaScript area, right? JavaScript has a lot of things for it. There's not a lot of JavaScript developers who are like, oh, hey, Hotwire, can I sign up for that? It's people who care about these other languages in much the same way that we care about Ruby. I care about Ruby to the point that I would like to write most of my application most of the time in Ruby. That's a major feature. The same is true for people who write Clojure, PHP. People who write Python, they tend to like their languages for all sorts of very good reasons. So Hotwire is also a celebration of the diversity of languages on the web, that the web is such a unique platform because it's not monolingual. It's not just, hey, you have to write in this specific language, that language in JavaScript, otherwise you don't have access to the web. Anyway, I'll stop the monologuing now. <laughs> no, it's great. It is fascinating because I remember seeing TurboLinks mentioned in other communities, just very rarely. Hey, we use TurboLinks and we like it. And then Hotwire is out. And yeah, I see a Laravel adapter like the same week. And Django, yeah, it's exciting. So right now, Hotwire, the whole package is a separate gem you bring in. Long term, do you think that will continue to be the case? Or do you think that will ship with Rails? Right now, the intention is that the next version of Rails is going to be a Rails 7 that we're going to take a leap. We're not going to do Rails 6.2. Normally, we do two minors, and then we do a major. I think this is exciting enough that it warrants a new major version of Rails. And we already ship TurboLinks with Rails as it is, as the default. We are absolutely going to ship Hotwire as the default in Rails 7. But of course, in the same optional way that we always ship TurboLinks. Hey, you don't like TurboLinks? Fine. It's literally, you comment it out in your gem file and your bundle, and it's gone. I want Rails to have a default experience out the box where you need to do nothing, nothing at all, and you can make a complete app that's fucking rock. You need nothing, nothing except for what's already there, all the things are in the box, and you can go off and do it. Now, most people will add in some stuff, and it's totally fine. We add stuff into all our apps, but the base box has to be good, and it in my opinion, needs answers to all the major questions. And Hotwire is a answer to how do you build a modern front end. By no means the only answer. For a very long time, Rails has committed itself to being a big tent. Hey, I'm not the biggest fan of Spa for all the things, but if you want to use Rails for that, high five. All good. Great. Wonderful. Let's have that diversity, even within the Rails tent, that you can do all the things, which is why. Webpacker, even though Webpack as a whole thing and JavaScript pipelines as a whole thing is something I have incredibly mixed feelings about. But you know what? 
I also wrote a lot of the Webpacker code because I was like, do you know what? This is what we need right now. The moment in time, we need Webpack. It allows us access to all these things. If I want to write a version of JavaScript that I don't hate, that was what we needed. I want to write ES6. I can't do that in, let's say, whatever, two, three, four years ago. I couldn't write ES6 and just have it work. You needed Babel. You needed translation. You needed all these things. So I'm happy that exists. I'm thrilled it exists. We just bootstrapped a new project for a group of maintainers who are working on Webpack to make it even better. Just because I want a simpler starting point does not in any way, shape, or form mean Rails is not here for people who do want to have half a Ruby app, half a JavaScript app, want to write a bunch of JavaScript. They want to use React. They want to use heavier spot techniques. They want to do all those things. Wonderful, great, excellent. But <laughs> if you're just starting out and you're just trying to learn Rails, because you want to make an app, do we really need to burden you with understanding all of Webpack and all of JavaScript pipelining and what do you do if the comma is wrong and you get the indecipherable error messages that come out of that? The side note, one of the reasons I got started on this whole ES6, ESM thing was I literally could not figure out, within the span of, I think, at least a good hour, how to copy some JavaScript code from Hey into a new app that I wanted to do something with because I fucking could get it to compile. And I was searching through all this Webpack configs and I was searching through all the things that were added on and I was like, this is so goddamn painful. Why is it so painful? And I was like, you know what? Actually, this all compiles down to one thing. Let me just fucking take the compiled output. I'll put the compiled output into the new thing I want to do something. I'll figure it out later. I'll figure out the tool. And then I used the compiled output. I was like, actually, why isn't this just what we do all the time? Why can't I just use the compiled version of the JavaScript thing I'm trying to do? Why do I have to build everything from source? I installed OS 10. I don't fucking build OS 10 from source. Do you know what? I don't need to build all Nokia Geary after tormenting, and I'm saying this in jest, tormenting Ruby developers for the better path of a decade by forcing everyone to do these local compilations. You have to figure out like which flags you were setting on your C compiler to get the fucking thing to work. And the number of times that I've Googled like Nookie Geary, Jim won't install thing and try to copy paste like just random pieces of C flag. I don't have enough fingers for the number of moves. So anyway, in Nookie Geary, we were like, hey, what if we just ship the compiled version? There's not that many configurations we need to do it for. Let's just do that. JavaScript, same fucking thing. In most cases, I'm just writing a little bit of JavaScript. I need to use some libraries to do it. I need to use some turbo, I need to use some stimulus, I need to use some, some stuff. But I'm not like redesigning these things. I don't need the whole built pipeline. I just want the compiled output. So that was actually the birth of, hey, do you know what? ES6, ESM? Hmm, maybe it could be. And then I, of course, just got curious because I just copied this one, two files over. I sidestep all this complexity. Can we do that all the time? That would be pretty cool. Or can we at least do it for anyone who's not fascinated by Webpack content or who don't need it? Or the React or the Tailwind customized bundle or, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Because I think a lot of developers, as they start up, that's not what they need. They just, again, they need the box. And the box needs to have the major tools and the hammer and the screwdriver and whatever. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll figure out what I really want. At some later stage, right now, what I want is I want an app. <laughs> and I needed to do some stuff. And I would like to get going with that without installing 18,000 files in my note underscore modules directory, just to say Rails new thing. That's the aspirational goal right now. We're not there because unlike a lot of other things I usually open source, this is at the moment speculative. Hey, use this Webpack. Basecamp, use this Webpack. Do I even need to use Webpack? I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we could have gotten pretty far without it. I'm keen to, to take a stab at pulling Webpack out of Hay, putting ES6 and ESM into it. And I don't actually think it would be that, that difficult, but it's speculative, which means when I say I would like for Rails 7 to do these things, it is still dependent on us validating that. Every single major mistake I've made in framework building has been the preemptive choice, right? 
I like, oh, I feel like I have a good idea. Let me program up that good idea and then I'll figure out how I should use it. You know what? It often ends poorly. So I've learned from that mistake, hopefully. And we're not going to ship Rails 7 without Webpack unless we have a damn compelling story that does most of the things most of the people need when they first get going and provides a direct, easy, single command path to jump on the Webpack train as, as we've had. You should be able to get started. Do you think as soon as you start hitting a wall and like, oh, shit, I can't do it. I, I really want to use this React thing or whatever. It should just be like, all right, Webpack are installed. Boom. It's all there. You're ready to go. Uh, no momentum loss. But we have some time, right? That's the other thing. So Rails 7, next major version. It's not like we're releasing that tomorrow. I hope we could have something by Rails talk, as it usually is. What that something is. Maybe that's a beta. Maybe it's even an alpha. Whatever. We need several months of people playing with this stuff for real. Building some stuff with it. Hitting all the stubs. Making it solid. Actually, just today, I released like three new versions of everything because it kept making a minor mistake. So we went like Turbo Rails 055. Oh, shit, I forgot this thing. Turbo Rails 056. Ah, shit, I, uh, the regex was wrong with the install script. Turbo Rails 057. So 057 is what it stands right now. But a bunch of stuff there to, to happen. The Turbo repository has a ton of interest, in part because all these other language communities are piling in. So there's a bunch of stuff to roll in there. Let's just keep baking for a while. Let's keep baking for a few months or three or four or whatever. And then when we get to the end of it, we'll do the bake off. We'll do the, is this actually better? Like the AP test of, of the code and the setup. But my confidence level that this is a workable path increases every day. I've yet to encounter, actually, I was just about to encounter a setback and it was tailwind. I was like, do you know what? I can see the whole path right now with JavaScript. I can see the stimulus path, I can see the turbo path, I can see ES6, I can see ESN. But shit, I cannot tell them. If I was going to start something, it was just me and I didn't have a designer who was already a, a CSS expert, I'd probably get time to tell when it go. Hmm. Okay, I mean, I could just include the three megabyte standard bundle, but that doesn't seem like it's a real workable thing. So we need to get purging. And that's actually what I did this week. I went, you know what? I'm not actually using Tailwind for anything. I don't have an app that has Tailwind. But I'm curious because it feels like it is one of those things that would perhaps block us on the road to, to be able to create a Rails future that doesn't have Webpack. But if I can clear that hurdle, maybe. Do you know what I did? I just did um, post CSS, perjure. Let me have a look at what this actually looks like. This thing was like, I don't know, 10 lines of code. It's the main thing that does the purging. It just iterates over your whole thing. It extracts all your potential class names from all these directories. And do you know what? This is not actually my favorite kind of programming, but I could probably do this. So I sat down and I like essentially translated the post the CSS perjure code to Ruby. And I was like, yeah, that wasn't that hard. That was a combined few hours. We're not going to fucking block on this because we're not going to do this combined for a few hours. Now, not the whole answer. And there's some other things. We tell them if you want to customize it and how do you add colors, and there are more unknowns. I think there are some answers coming to that. There's a project for allowing you to customize Tailwind on the web in like the old school style you used to customize a bundle for jQuery where you would kick off the things you wanted. So perhaps there's also a way to do that still in such a way that you don't need to install the whole build pipeline. Because ultimately for me, this out-of-the-box experience that I'm aiming for is one in which your machine does not even have NPM installed. Now, I'm not saying that because NPM is hard to install. I think it's not. Room makes so many things easy, at least for me and my platform. You can do it, but I'm just like, you know what? It's kind of almost a challenge. Can we get so far? I don't even need NPM on the system. I would like to see if we could get that far. And if we do, I think we get all these other dividends. We get these dividends of someone showing up to a Rails boot camp for the first time. Don't also need to figure out how I get the whole JavaScript thing going. They just do the Ruby thing. Hey. I mean, maybe that's like month two is like the NPM stuff or month three or whatever. It's not the blocker for Hello World or even much further than that. Yeah, I would like to hear more about kind of some other ideas you have for Rails 7. Before we jump to that, there were a lot of questions about Strata and mobile, mobile, mobile. How does that missing piece, air quotes, fit into the, the Hotwire package? 
So one of the things I'm really proud about Hotwire is the fact that it has, not only has a mobile story, it was forged in the flames of mobile. In fact, and I've talked about this on another podcast, like Turbo Frame came to be because we had trouble getting our web stuff into mobile overlays. And that's how we got up with Turbo Frames. And like, oh, a frame is like what you would want in a, a mobile overlay because you don't want all the Chrome around. You, know, you want to be able to just take it out and so on. We don't just have a mobile story and that's like a side thing. It's like part of the main thing. Part of the main thing at Basecamp is that we need a development environment that makes hybrid native development easy. You've got your glorious monolith. It serves as the foundation of not just your website, but also your mobile apps. Like we write for Hey, for example, we have a wonderful iOS app that's written in all native iOS in as much as the native part. We're not using a framework. We're not using React Native. We're not using any other. Like we have two iOS developers who are really good at iOS and they could make a 100% iOS app if that's what they were interested in. So that's where we come at it from. But they can get to do their stuff like the most diligent, high fidelity. If you take the Hey app, for example, like the whole inbox is native. The whole damn thing. There's not a shred of HTML and inbox. As soon as you do things, you go to pages, you go to settings, you go to a topic, you go anywhere else, then all the web stuff starts coming in. But we needed to pair those two things together. How can you write essentially like 10% of your app or 5% of your app or 2% or 40%, whatever percent you want in native where it feels you're giving up nothing. You got 100% straight to the metal, whatever. And then for all the other stuff where it's either cumbersome, expensive, doesn't matter, whatever, whatever, you take your majestic monolith and you make that the center of it. So that's what we've done with, with Hotwire. And these mobile adapters we have for both iOS and for Android, are damn good in a way that's like, this isn't concept code of like speculative from a bunch of web people. Yeah, I don't want to touch native which I'm being on the web, but the wonderful thing is that Basecamp is not just me, and we have these awesome, capable native developers who are really good at what they do, and have, we've managed to fuse those things together so that they can do the things that they're really good at, and we can ship apps like Hey and Basecamp with tiny, tiny teams. Basecamp has 300 screens, if you count it all up. It's built by two people, and the, or two programmers and a designer. There's no fucking way. We were going to build a native iOS app with 300 screens and make it good with two people in like the time they took to build it. No, 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 no way, no how, impossible. So that's what we're here for with, with Hot Air as well, is to keep that story to others. Feel like Hotwire is the final grand reveal of whatever secret source we supposed to source and saw that we have at a base camp in terms of how we actually work as a company. How do we make Basecamp happen on all these platforms with this small team size? How do we make Hey happen in much the same way? And we kind of would say like, oh, well, we use Rails, we're a majestic monolith, and we use triplings, and then we were waving our hands about the rest. Mm-hmm. Then we've essentially taken all of it and we put it on the table and like, this is it, here you go, have fun. So Strata is the last missing bit of that, but it's really just like the seasoning up on top. It's the last 5%. It's a way to make it a little easier to when you have to talk between the two sides, talk between what's happening on the web in terms of letting the web specialize native. So what we have is tags and controllers, stimulus controllers, that will specialize how some things work in a native app. Like some of the modal overlays, they're native, but they're driven by, as in, Like what should be in them is described in the HTML so we can change it without releasing a new app, which is this other wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, It should be no secret that I am, I love the app stores. Like the app stores are the fucking worst. It's almost, it's like the yin and yang. App stores are the fucking worst and the web is the fucking best. And the more of the web I can get in and the more I can push out the app stores in terms of their monopolistic abuse of power that they exert on all developers who want to publish software to the computers we have in our pockets, the happier I am. And the fact that we have been able to push out so much of it just that we can ship a whole new feature in Basecamp. We don't have to ship a new app. As long as that feature uses the things that we have in the native app and can trigger it, and it can even add native overlays and whatever because we drive those out of the HTML. 
doesn't mean everything. And okay, so we do have to ship new apps. And that part is fine. The less we have to do it, the better it is. Every single time I don't have to submit an app to Master Apple, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's all that. Don't wait for Strata, though. Strata was a relative newcomer. They can, for example, does not have a Strata. We just did it ad hoc. Strata a more than anything, a set of convention that makes it a little bit easier and give you some guidance. But like the meat of this is in the adapters and they're damn fine and you can start using them right now. Don't wait for Strata. When it comes, it's, oh yeah, that'll be nice. I can re- remove a few pieces of code and, and so on and so forth. But also, thing, the other thing with native is like, for most people, most of the time when you're building a major thing, it's not like you just go, boom, I have a native app that does it all, right? It takes a while. Native is not super fast to develop in, in the same way that the web is and the immediacy of it, if you want to build something good. And that's part for parcel and different domain and whatever. So you can totally start now and, and probably by the time you feel like you need Strata, maybe it's out. That's interesting. One of the things you were talking about was using HTML more. And I was going to ask a lot of people building a mobile app or SPAs, they're all using JSON for everything. And one of the interesting things was the Turbo Stream stuff is all HTML with a template tag inside of it. And it's doing almost the same thing as you would do in JSON. And I thought that was really interesting. And I was curious, like, how did you guys stumble on using that? HTML is a data format. People think of HTML as though it's a presentation thing. It's that. But it's also, I mean, how do you fucking think a browser displays HTML? You think it like goes off and reads like uh, some translation poem or something? I wonder what they meant here. No, it's tagged. And, like it's a uh, syntax and it's all described and you can present it. And that was one of the things that kind of just sort of the whole thing with Bob or server side. It was like, Actually, what kind of spa app does not need to talk to the server anyway to commit the things that it changes or otherwise? Like, you need that round trip anyway. And that round trip, for most of the time, that's the expensive part. It's like literally sending a package across the internet to, to get to the server, do your SSL handshake, at least for the initial connection, and then back again, right? It's not what's in it. Whether you send, I don't know, half a K of JSON or one K of HTML, what? That's not the part that's slow. It's not the part that's fast or whatever. It just doesn't matter. If we use HTML in this way, we can just get so much of this other stuff that we were doing otherwise. Now, I understand there are cases and, and whatever where that doesn't always work or, or those round trips. In some cases, you can do some stuff on a client-side app where you don't submit it right away or you submit it a thing and there can be some circumstances where it's better, but as a general thing for like most kind of information technology apps, like your GitHub's and your Basecamp's and your Shopify's and your Airbnb's and your Zendes, then you insert almost every other web app in the world into that box, right? Like that's not the thing. Most apps are not Figma. Most apps are not like Photoshop on the web. For those apps, I totally agree. Hotwire is not an answer to any of that. Hotwire is not an answer to a client side text editor. We built one called Trick, fucking great, but it needed to be built in JavaScript on the client. You, you weren't going to send uh, every character to the server and feel the lag of that. No, 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 no. Perfect example of something that needs to be fully client side. And then for us, we built that once and then we just keep using it. We don't have to keep doing it. So much of Hotwire is about paying the lowest possible price for the bit of interactivity that you need. Not just, oh, I need an app. Let me just pay full cost for every screen all the time because I'm using the most, air quotes, sophisticated. I don't actually believe this, and I think it's a bullshit word, but let's just use it for a second. Air quotes, sophisticated framework that allows you to do the most high fidelity, whatever, whatever. Most screens don't need that. Pay for what you need. Pay as you go. So when all you need is whatever, setting screen that gets access once in a blue moon and you need to change a few things. You don't even need to do anything. It can just be a standard HTML screen. It's miss the whole goddamn thing and gets it back. Interpret drive, make that just feel fast enough. And no one, absolutely no one is going to go, have you considered uh, making that setting screens and all native because that would save like a millisecond for me or something when I need it every three months? No, no one is ever, ever, ever going to say that. Versus, super high traffic parts of your app, like in, hey, like the inbox, 
with them, right? You're in there all the time. If you use email, like that needs to be really good. You're willing to pay top dollar for the highest level of fidelity that you can get in that. And that's what you should pay for. Chris, you know what really just bugs me? Hmm. It's a, it seems like it's on the tip of my tongue. Bugs. Oh, dang it. <laughs> I knew it. All bugs. Real bugs. Bugs in my app. Bugs money. Anything with a bug in it. Bugs yeah, me. I, I can see why. I can see why. So I'm asking Chris for your professional opinion as a thought leader in the industry. How should I handle these bugs? You know, I, I learned in school that, that honey badgers are really good at helping with bug problems. Do you mean a literal honey badger? Or maybe honeybadger.io. But if I sign up for honey badger, what do I get? Well, something that is really useful that actually just saved my butt the other day was their uptime monitoring was doing an update on one of my apps and made a deploy and didn't notice right away that it went down. So that was a really good, useful feature there. Not to mention that they've got your error monitoring for those bugs. Bugs. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you should go check out Honey Badger. It sounds like. Sounds like it. <laughs> Does using HTTP2 help speed up the request there where you're not having to negotiate SSL every time and, and all that? Yes, HTTP2 is wonderful. And I was really sad to learn, and normally I'm a booster, but I was really sad to learn. It's not a default thing on Heroku. What the fuck, guy? I mean, crew, figure it out. I said, I, we've been running HTTP2 for quite a while at, at Base. I mean, even if you're not doing hotwire or whatever, HTTP2 is eight. The longer away you are from the servers, the more eight it is because the fewer packages you have to send off, the more, the less SSL handshaking you have to do. HTTP2 essentially makes it such that there's no benefit to bundling. Whether you ship one file or you ship 20 files, as long as you start the request with the 20 files, it's actually better in many ways on many spectrums to ship 20 files than it is to ship one file. That's a complete change, complete change for how we used to do things. And one of the main arguments for bundling, which was that you took all your JavaScript and whatever, and even your CSS, and you boiled it down into one file because then you only have the one handshake, you wouldn't run out of connections, you wouldn't do all these other things. You send that. And as you put P2 essentially says, like, you know what? As long as you start the request at the same time, they all run in parallel. This is a multiplexing channel here. You just start them at the same time. You start 10 requests. They're going to come back at the same time. And you're going to have vastly superior cache dynamics when you request 20 individual files while expire when they individually need to expire. Unlike the bundling world, where if you change a comma somewhere, boom, just blown away 200k of cache. That's not a good setup. The same thing with frames. So this whole idea that you could lazy load parts of the page with additional HTTP requests was not as compelling an idea before HTTP2. This idea that when we load the Hey inbox, we're kicking off like four HTTP requests or five, I think it is. On some of these topic pages, we're kicking off like eight, I think it is. That there used to be a heavy price and you needed to really consider carefully, do we need another HTTP request or can we mash it all together into a bundle essentially? HTTP2 allows us to unbundle our JavaScript, our CSS, and our HTML pages. There are some other trade-offs and times things you have to consider, blah, 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 blah. But it is a different world. The trade-offs are different. And that's also the other thing that has led me to be so excited about ES6 and ESM. Because it feels like we're just catching up to what HTTP2 made possible. HTTP2 is from, what, 2013 or something like that was when it started rolling up. It's been seven years, or eight and we're just finally going like, oh, actually, what does this mean for bundling? Oh, and we don't need that in the same way that we did before. Maybe it's not as important. I find those moments fascinating. They're, because there are moments where you just go like, all right, we've walked all the way up this ladder of the JavaScript pipeline, blah, 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 building, tree shaking, whatever, whatever. Then we're standing up there and we're like, oh, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Let's put that entire ladder aside. Is there now a different path? Oh, shit, there is. Fuck, we don't even need a ladder. We need like a, a stool 
I guess Stuhl will do the job now, which just allows us to get rid of uh, just a mountain of complexity. And that's the other thing. We're constantly, like, there's a gravitational force in all of software and trivially so in web development that just attracts complexity. It's like just a mass. And actually, the bigger the mass gets, the more gravitational force it has, and the more it just lands into it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. bigger, bigger. Sometimes you need a black hole, and you just need to suck it all in, the sun collapses, and boom, it's just gone. And then you go like, oh, there's another sun gathering over there. Let's start from scratch in a new gravitational force, and we can do different choices in different ways. And this feels like one of those moments where you like have this black hole collapse of the old way of doing front end and whatever, and we can just see whatever gas clouds are forming the next star. And that's exciting because it does not happen very often. I've been doing web development 20 F and actually 25 years. I think I made my first website in 95 or 94. I've been doing website or web development for a long fucking time. And people keep saying, like, oh, everything moves so fast. No, it doesn't. It doesn't move fast at all. You look over those 25 years, there's not that many huge moments. 2005, Ajax. Big moment. 2000, whatever. 9, 10, 11, whenever the iPhone started being able to do apps, fucking moment, JavaScript getting good, fun, you could do the whole thing, big moment, for the right or wrong moment, big moment, now again, it feels like one of those big moments. How many is that? Four? Five? Over 25 years? Not that many. Things don't move that fast. If you zoom out and look at things that the sort of galaxy plane of things, or even solar system, or whatever metaphor I'm in now. So that's what's cool. Hotwire feels like it's right there. And what's so compelling about it too, and what's so interesting about it too, is like, not just about Hotwire, right? Like, I'm actually a big believer in this idea that if, if something is worthwhile, more people are going to arrive at the same idea at the same time. It's funny, it's the same thing happened with email. For the longest time, everyone just went like, email, solve problem, Gmail, they got to figure it out, whatever, just use Gmail. Then all of a sudden in the past, let's say three years or whatever, fucking a million different email things are popping up. Email, even older than the web, been along for a long time. And all of a sudden, a bunch of people at the same time seem to get the same idea that, hey, actually, maybe email is not dead. Maybe this whole bullshit about email is dead is, yeah, bullshit. And if we try to give it another go, there's some cool shit here. And Gmail is a stagnant hole. And that can't stop all everyone else from doing something. And we finally realized that. Hey, appeared at the same time that a bunch of other things appeared uh, because we all got the same idea at the same time. Hotwire feels like the same thing. This pendulum swinging back, server side is back in vogue, all the stuff. That's cool. It's definitely exciting for Rails developers specifically. We've been speculating for a year now. What is this new magic? And so, <laughs> yeah, so Hotwire is out and a lot of exciting things happening there. I'm curious and not asking for like promises, just asking for some of the ideas you have for Rails 7. Are there any cool things you've worked up at Basecamp that you might want to extract or just new ideas you're exploring? We have several things lined up for extraction at Basecamp, all coming out of hay. I feel like I, I go through these valleys up and down with my involvement in Rails because sometimes it just, I don't have a bunch of new ideas. And then sometimes I start working on a new thing and I fucking get an explosion of new ideas and we start working on a million different things at the same time because we need that to create the thing. For us, the thing was, hey, and we spent two years building it. And to build it, we have to build a bunch of other things. One of the things I'm super excited about is encryption. So a lot of people are going like, oh, well, I encrypt my backup. Back up our database, we encrypt our backup. That's, that's cool. What happens if someone gets access to your database? They have access to all the data from all the people that's on your multi-tenant database. And then the answer for 99% of all SaaS apps is yes, they do. When we started developing Hey, we went, you know what? That's not good enough. The criticality of email, personal email, is an order of magnitude higher than what it is for Basecamp. Basecamp is important. People keep like important business shit in there and you don't want to leak the business shit. But you know what? You really don't want to leak someone's fucking letter from their doctor. There's just a criticality that's extreme. Well, not extreme. Let's not go over the hill here. It's not about things exploding left and right. And if we lose an email, a plane doesn't crash. But a couple of steps down from that, not a million steps away from that, it's the criticality of that kind of personal information. We need to treat that in a different way than we would treat something like a base camp or a SAS app or in general. Encryption came up as a way to deal with that and derive 
came up in a way to deal with that, such that the someone gets a hold of our live database, whatever, hackers, they get into the thing. Unless they have the key, all the, the data in there is it's just encrypted. <laughs> you can't get at it. And that whole approach of having in-flight encryption, the database is live. It's fetching things from the database, but the things are encrypted in the database. They don't get it decrypted until an app instance that has the decryption key loaded accesses it with a major level up. And I'm really excited to put stuff into Rails that makes that easy because that was not easy. We spent months and months trying to get that right. We had a full encryption review done for it, all sorts of stuff just to get the like, hey, not only is this important, we also have to get it right. Because if you get encryption wrong, it's essentially like uh, locking yourself in a box and throwing away the key. You're not getting the shit back. I just thought this story about how this dude in San Francisco had 200 million in Bitcoin laying on some device where he had two tries of his password left. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be there having two tries of the password left to all the email and hey, that would be bad. So all sorts of stuff we have to do. That's an extraction that's coming. Hopefully, we're ready for Rails, and we're actively working on it right now. We've been running it for, for quite a while. That's going to be cool. Another thing we pulled out was logging. So Rails really has had an interesting, I don't know, maybe standard approach to logging, which is, hey, here's a bunch of text, and we generate a ton of it per request. You have to fuck figure out what to do with it. What, are you going to prep it? Are you going to put it somewhere? Are you just going to throw it away? Like, logging is, is actually an interesting problem at scale. Once you're doing like hundreds of requests per second, the amount of lock volume you generate is huge. And at the same time, a lot of locks are necessary for you to be able to debug issues and so on. So you can't just throw it away. So for Hey, we started working on structured logging, essentially taking a whole request worth of information and compressing that down to one hash. That's more like structured logging is, is you don't grep anymore. It has structure and bits you need and query on and index and all sorts of stuff, you can pull those out as their data set. So that's something else we've been working on. Hope to get that in. And then um, let's see what the fine folks that particularly Shopify and GitHub come up with. Both of them are running latest Rails, Master, whatever. Working with them on a bunch of stuff, they always come up with interesting new things that we then end up using at Basecamp. All the work that GitHub and Eileen in particular did on MultiDB was something we now use at Bacon and we barely wrote any of it and it would have been a lot of work to do it. And, and this is the wonders of open source. You show up with the cool shit you made and other people will show up with the cool shit they made and you trade and you share and you don't have to write all the cool shit yourself. Yeah, that's exciting. There was a question asked on Twitter that it's the question I actually share too. So the question was along the lines of kind of like, what is your ideal stack even inside Rails? database testing. I would like to assume that it's mostly the default rail stack, but yeah, I was just curious when you're starting a new project, what does that look like for you? I get to cheat and I readily admit that my default just gets to be the rail default. So when I say vanilla, it's not like some abstract objective notion of vanilla. It is literally just my preferences and I bake those into rails and I call those the default. So that is a little bit cheating, which is another way to say that we use very, very close stock rails. If we're not using stock rails, it's because we're working on like the next version of stock rails. So we do testing with fixtures and with mini tests. It was interesting. We just hired uh, someone who worked a lot with uh, factory bot and RSpec and now came to Basecamp and is working with fixtures and, and mini tests. And I'm going to lean on that. Daniel, if you're listening, then this is something we're going to work on that to get some of those things, because sometimes I take things for granted. We came up with the, the approach to testing we use at Basecamp is almost indistinguishable from the approach to testing I had in 2004. I haven't changed my opinions very much at all. Fixtures are wonderful. And when I say things like, it's funny, like, it's almost like ancient knowledge sounds so preposterous, or, or, or what do you call it, like to inflate it. But it's almost like we forget these things. Why do we have fixtures? Why, why was that be another thing we came up with? Speed! Fucking speed! I want to be able to run 2,200 tests with whatever it is we have in, hey, I think it's 20,000 assertions. I want to run those tests on my developing machine in a minute and a half. Actually, no, I kid you not. The new MacBook M1, a minute, 12 seconds, I think, for the hey test suite. 
And it is 12 seconds because we get to engage all those eight cores and those eight cores just fucking scream. And they're really fast. They're blowing away. I had like this new iMac, not even the iMac Pro. I'm not actually sure if it's faster than the iMac Pro. I haven't been able to benchmark that. But I, I got the like the high spec version of the normal iMac, which is already a honking eight core beast, whatever. This fucking Mac M1 MacBook Air, not Pro, Air, no fan, no nothing. Boom, blows it away. Anyway, that's possible because of fixtures. You can't do that if you create everything in every test and with like creates and whatever. The fixture loop where it all exists, it's inserted once, and then each test just rolls back the transaction, and then it's the next one's turn. That's what makes it possible. Anyway, it was funny because there was this discussion on Twitter where someone's like, how many tests do you have? Or we were talking about it, I think maybe when Fowler started the thing where people were like, oh, I, how fast do you deploy? After you get past 15 minutes, it starts being a little painful. I'm like, 15 minutes? I want to be able to just deploy in three minutes. Literally, that's the target of base camp. Hey, deploys in three minutes, and we do the whole Kubernetes, whatever, build kite, jungle thing. We're not quite at three minutes. I think we're at four minutes, 20 or something. Anyway, part of that's possible because we also run the entire test suite whenever we deploy. We actually usually run it twice. We run when you commit your thing, and then just before the deploy, there's like a smoke thing, whatever. We run the test a lot. They need to be fast. They don't need to be no database fast. That's the other thing. I and mean, I'm trying to hit this medium of like, I don't write tests believing that I should run 200,000 tests in like a second. Don't need to do that because I don't want to stop my database and just run pure Ruby the whole time. But you can find somewhere in the middle, fixtures and tests. All right. That was a very long version of this thing. I use mini tests. I use fixtures. I use Maka for stopping when we occasionally do that. Don't do a lot of that. The whole thing about fixtures is that you have the whole world is there. Every single part of the app has data in it. So... You only interrogate, anyway, not a lot of tests, right? Not a lot of mocking. When we actually only mock when we do external service. We use MySQL. I've used MySQL since, whatever, 95. And when people ask me that question, <laughs> which database do you use? And I'm almost like, I say MySQL, and then they say Postgres. And it's like, yeah, I don't care. I'm not that interested in databases. MySQL has been a complete non-event for the past, whatever, 18 years I've been using it. I haven't thought about MySQL one time. Now, maybe a little bit of that is because we have a crack ops team and, and that's great, but not really. In terms of the development experience, I, I, don't, I don't give a fuck. I really don't. So we could also use Postgres and I would not care. It's so interesting. The people who use MySQL are usually the people who just don't care that much about databases and the people who use Postgres and want to tell you about it are, are yeah, the people who use Postgres, right? It's kind of like, how do you know someone used Postgres? They can't fucking stop talking about it. Which I respect in other ways. I can't fucking stop talking about Ruby, so peace be with it. Just for me, my sequel, totally fine, totally great. Then I use Redis. Redis is wonderful. I would like to do a little more tooling around it for Rails. But also, like, I've tried, I think, at least three times thinking, like, all right, I'll make a wrapper for Redis. And I can't beat the native interface. I can't beat it in my AV. You're like, fuck. Oh, it really makes something. The commands are a little abbreviated for my taste and a little set X and this, that, and the other thing. But it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think we're getting close, and there are some patterns that we keep using it with that we want to make it a little easier, so that maybe something. Redis is good. It's not just good for storing ephemeral data. It's also good for storing job queues. We just run active job with Rescue. We don't use anything more sophisticated or fancy than that. It's just Rescue, which is obviously used the Redis as a backend. And then we put all our caches in Redis, too. So all our template caching and, and whatever happens in Redis. Redis is great. And I think the final major piece is Elasticsearch. So all the search on, across all our apps is done with Elasticsearch. I think that's it. I think otherwise vanilla Rails with the default stuff and all the frameworks, of course. We use all the skin and the bone and the hide and the hooks and the mouth of Rails in all of our higher apps. Usually there's not a lot of unused parts. Yeah, that's enlightening. I been wanting to talk about tests for a while with you. And so like just hearing how you use fixtures and stuff, like I've started on side projects trying to adopt the default Rails testing stack. And I do notice, if nothing, just a speed improvement out of the box. I don't have to install parallel tests or anything like that. And that was a major level up. I forget when that was Rails 6.0 maybe that we now by default, we use all your cores. Huge level up. It's so funny because this whole thing with you have a million cores on your dev machine, it's like relatively new. We used to have, I don't know, two or maybe we had 
four, right? Like the speed up wasn't dramatic. Now that you have eight cores, the speed up is very dramatic. So it makes a huge difference. I don't know how slow the hay weed is if you run it on a single core, but I don't know, maybe it does take actually eight minutes or seven minutes or something like that. Yeah, happy with that. But we need the better education. We need some, I thought pictures was the simplest thing in the world. Clearly it's not because the number of people who were picking other ways of doing testing in base camp, just that empirical fact stating that something in how fixtures work is not immediately obvious, why it's good and why it's easy and, and whatever. So now that we have a former factory bot and our spec user and the team, hopefully we can take some of that in, maybe some API stuff. I continue to be befuddled by the success of our spec. And I've been watching that for fucking 15 years. I'm like, I still don't get it. I don't get it. My brain is wired in a way that I cannot appreciate whatever it is our spec does for people. That's also the other thing. It's wonderful. You can get help, right? You don't need to understand everything. And sometimes your brain is just incompatible with understanding certain things. And then you get some help and some other people come in and then they, they, they teach you or they fix it even better. So. Awesome. Very much appreciate you taking the time to join us and talk all things rails. Any other quick questions or yeah, anything like that for David before we wrap up? I got a quick one. What would you say to the junior developers out there who are learning Rails and being told potentially by their boot camps or by their friends or just the community at large that Rails is slow, they're never going to find a job and that they have to write React? The short version is it's fucking bullshit. Don't listen to them. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And if that's all you're hearing from, maybe you should find a new boot camp as a new friend. That's the hyperbolic extreme version. But Let's just take a few things of it. You're not going to find a developer job in Rails. Have you fucking looked at like, I don't know, the Y Combinator top, whatever, most successful startups that's come out of that thing, right? Half of them run Rails. From Shopify to GitHub, to Airbnb, to Sendesk. There's literally not quite a billion companies, but there's a lot of companies that are very big and they're hiring a shit ton, right? So there's all of that. And then there are all the new companies starting out. These things go in fast. And Rails benefited from those fasts. In 2006, everyone was like, oh, you need to use Rails for all the things. For a while now, it's been JavaScript. The pendulum is fucking coming back. And we're not going to write fucking JavaScript and React until the end of time for everyone, right? That's not a thing. So it's opening back up. It's going to be great. Rails 7 is kicking ass. Ruby 3 just came out. We just fucking launched Hotwire. There's nothing more electricity, pardon the pun, in the Rails community in, in a very long time. And the companies that are, are invested in Rails have never been more invested. There was a long time where GitHub ran on like Rails 2, 3, I don't know, seven years or something. And then a bunch of people over there, they got it up to date and now, up to, now they're contributing something at, uh, at Shopify. They have very large teams, very heavily invested. It's great. If you learn Rails, you're going to have a great time. Sounds like the perfect place to end it. So thanks for being on. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks. Talk to you all later. All right. Thank you. Yeah.